to begin. I'm Michael Flanagan, Director of Public Programs at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And on behalf of the Institute, I'd like to welcome you to our fourth evening, as over several years, our fourth evening with Colin Wilson. In a moment, uh, Charles Tart will provide us with an introduction of his friend, Colin Wilson. I'd like to make just a few quick announcements before that. Uh, this Monday, Colin will join with the president of our institute, Robert McDermott, uh, with pre this mic. Uh, this Monday, Colin Wilson will join with the president of our institute, Robert McDermott, for a presentation of their two views on Rudolf Steiner at the San Francisco Waldo School. That's located on Washington Street, just off the Visadero on Pacific Heights. There is a flyer at the rear table uh, that you can pick up after the lecture. Um, tonight's lecture is a lead-in to uh, an all-day uh, workshop that will be held at the uh, University of San Francisco tomorrow at the Lone Mountain Conference Center. If you're interested in joining that, uh, it'll be a relatively small group, and you should see me at the registration table at the end of the evening. Uh, we also have at that table, I think there are only three titles remaining, but um, some assortment of Collins' 100 books uh, available from our bookstore. Finally, this lecture is being taped by Sound Photosynthesis. Uh, their personnel will make copies of this lecture available to you immediately after the lecture, and we ask as a courtesy to them that no other, uh, no other taping be done. Uh, I'm very pleased that Charles Tark was available this evening to introduce his friend Colin. Uh, like Colin Wilson, he is a leader in the humanistic and transpersonal movement of psychology that traces back to Abraham Maslow. He's the editor of the very well-known anthologies, uh, Altered States of Consciousness and Transpersonal Psychology, and the author of the more recent Waking Up, Overcoming Obstacles to Human Potential. So, it's a great pleasure to present Charles T. Tart, who will then introduce Colin Wilson. Which one's the PA? Is this a silly little thing? <laughs> I would move this closer so you could hear me, but they seem to have tried to keep people from me like moving the microphones around. Can you hear me okay? No. Well, I could give up the microphone entirely and just speak so you can hear me. How's that? Okay. Is there a house sound person? Who knows? Maybe one will materialize. I hope your voice is in good form, Colin. Uh, it's a real pleasure to get up here to introduce Colin because these chairs fit a theory I've developed over the years that the more expensive and fancy looking a piece of furniture is, the less comfortable it is. <laughs> I, I don't know why that should be so, but it seems to work that way. I first met Colin three years ago at dinner before his last talk here, but of course I had met him through his book many years before that and had been intrigued by many, many of his books. We have a particular shared interest in fields like parapsychology and in areas like Gurdjieff psychology and in the potentials that human beings have. I think Colin is considerably more learned than I in these areas. Uh, I'm overwhelmed when I look at what he's written about. Uh, we all, my wife and I also had the pleasure of visiting him last summer. And he's got about five or six special buildings built around his house to house his own personal library of 30,000 books or so. And I, I must confess to being incredibly envious. I don't know where he gets time to read. He claims he doesn't have time to read, but I know he reads a lot of that stuff. I did decide that perhaps the best way to introduce Colin would be to really familiarize myself with his literary career. I hear the sound coming up. Is that better? Good. So now if I speak in a more normal tone of voice, you can still hear me. Okay, so I decided to really check out what Colin has done literary-wise. So I fired up my computer this morning, went to Melville, 
And after eliminating all the extra blank spaces you get in that University of California library catalog, I got a list of Collins' books to be able to get the main highlights here. Oh, I've rolled it up backwards. Excuse me a second. I've got to get to the beginning of the list. Could one of you take the end of this and help me unroll it? Uh, Colin has really made it in terms of the University of California library catalog. And I just want to use this to illustrate some of his books. I'm not going to tell you all about it. And as I say, this was carefully edited to eliminate all the extra spaces. There is a beginning to this, or at least there was earlier. <laughs> this is your life. There used to be a TV program by that name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just to tell you some of these things, I'll give you titles. Dark Dimensions, A Celebration of the Occult. The Directory of Possibilities. How much more Californian could you get than that? There's also one that came up without much explanation, a video recording called Examination of the Musculoskeletal System. There must be another Colin, Colin Wilson in there, okay? But the rest of these are his. Marx refuted the verdict of history. Access to Inner Worlds, the story of Brad Abset. That was fascinating. Adrift in Soho, Afterlife, an investigation of the evidence for life after death. Alistair Crowley, the nature of the beast. Lamore, the ways of love. Not many of us academics have expertise there. Anti-Sartre with an essay on Camus. Beyond the Occult. Beyond the Outsider, the philosophy of the future. The bicameral critic. The Black Room, a novel. A book of booze. A case book of murder. Chords and discords, purely personal opinions on music. The craft of the novel. A criminal history of mankind. Is there any other kind of history? Um, <laughs> A uh, number of novels from the Spider World series, The Delta, The Desert, Eagle and Earwig, An Encyclopedia of Murder, Enigmas and Mysteries, Existentially Speaking, Essays on the Philosophy and Literature. The Geller Phenomena, we all remember Yuri Geller, Bending Spoons and Keys. I never could figure out what people did when they got home who had their keys bent, <laughs> how they got into their house. But. A book on G.I. Gurdjieff, one called The Glass Cage, an unconventional detective story, The God of the Labyrinth, The Haunted Man, Hermann Hesse, Introduction to the New Existentialism, Jack the Ripper, Summing Up in Verdict, The Janus Murder Case, The Killer, a novel, Lord of the Underworld, Jung in the 20th Century, The Magician from Siberia, about Rasputin, Man Without a Shadow, The Diary of an Existentialist, a novel, the Mind Parasites, that's a really neat novel, that's one of my favorites. The Misfits, A Study of Sexual Outsiders. The Musician is Outsider. Incidentally, if I repeat any books where the title is changed slightly, it's because I don't have a long enough memory span to keep them going all through this list and not mark repeats. Mysteries, An Investigation into the Occult, the Paranormal, and the Supernatural. Mysterious Powers. Necessary Doubt, another novel. The New Existentialism. New Pathways in Psychology, Maslow and the Post-Freudian Revolution. Order of Assassins, The Psychology of Murder. Origins of the Sexual Impulse, and of course, The Outsider. The Personality Surgeon, I've missed that one. That sounds interesting. The Philosopher's Stone. Ah, you see, I've missed exactly the wrong one. Poetry and Mysticism. I've missed that one too, but that appeals to me. Poltergeist, The Study in Destructive Hauntings. The Quest for Wilhelm Reich. Religion and the Rebel. See, sometimes I try to figure out what he hasn't written about, but I haven't just figured that out yet. Ritual in the Dark. If you began rolling up at the other end, I would appreciate that. I, I, want, I want Colin to be able to take this home. Ah, Rudolf Steiner, The Man in His Vision. I asked him earlier tonight why he hadn't written about Rudolf Steiner yet, but I was premature. <laughs> Scandal, The Schoolgirl Murder Case. Science fiction is existentialism. The Serial Killers, A Study in the Psychology of Violence. 
The Sex Diary of Gerald Thorne, The Space Vampires, Star Seekers, The Stature of Man, Strange Powers, The Strength to Dream, Imagination and Literature. I mean, quite aside from his productions as a writer, he's made serious contributions to the craft of writing and teaching that to others. They had strange powers. Tree by Tolkien, The Unexplained, The Violent World of Hugh Green, Voyage to a Beginning, a Preliminary Autobiography, The War Against Sleep, which I particularly found fascinating because this is about Gurdjieff's philosophy, The World of Violence, and that's it for the ones I hope I didn't repeat. Now, I find this absolutely amazing. Uh, we, we get lots of people who are very specialized in certain kind of knowledge. And uh, sometimes they hide their, their shallowness outside of that by always managing to turn conversations back to their particular area of expertise. But Colin really has an incredibly wide range of knowledge here. I'm going to tell you one more anecdote about him, which I think I may have precognized. This morning, my wife read me a very interesting story that's a sort of spiritual teaching. And for some reason, I brought it along. It didn't, wasn't at all clear to me how it would fit in. And at dinner, I heard an anecdote from Colin that was quite parallel to this. He was talking about how he had been doing a lot of traveling, and in some hotel, he accidentally bumped his head into a towel bar that had been put right over a shower in a very awkward position. And as soon as he did so, he came down with a terrible cold almost immediately. He had been using his determination and his busyness and his aim to ward off these kinds of things. Well, that leads into a very interesting story about a yogi who practiced a Tibetan tantric practice called Che. Che is a thing where you visualize sacrificing your body, which is all you really have that you can give away, to all sorts of demons and spirits to feed them as sort of the ultimate gift and a process of learning to become unattached. Well, here's the story. There's a well-known account of a practitioner of Che while he was in the burial ground practicing, deeply engrossed in his meditation chant and the use of ritual instruments, along came a thief who tried to steal his bag and some other possessions. While attempting to do so, the thief became very frightened. Overcome by fear, he took out his sword and sliced off the head of the practitioner while he was deeply absorbed in practice. When the head dropped off and hit the ground, the thief became horrified and ran far away. This chair practitioner, who was deeply involved in the unity of appearances and emptiness, thought that this was just a false apparition manifesting as an obstacle. Without a second thought, he reached down, picked up his head, and placed it back in position while he continued on with the practice. To him, this was just part of the practice. When his meditation was complete, he put his instruments away and went back home. A few days later, he was out circumambulating at the stupa nearby, and the same thief saw him there and recognized him as the very yogin whose head he had sliced off. He was overcome with horror, terror and remorse to see him there alive and well. Now, if he hadn't said anything, it would have been just fine. But unfortunately, he went up to the yogin and prostrated himself, confessing what he had done. The yogin immediately got doubt about it and said, oh, so you're the one who really came and cut off my head? With that thought, his head fell off and he died. <laughs> now, I think there's a moral here about reminding us that when you have a determined aim, when you have some idea of where you're going and really the energy and the knowledge to put into it, you go a long way, but you have to be careful about doubt at the end, towel bars and thieves and the like. So without much further ado, I give you one of the great lights of our time and a fascinating speaker, Colin Wilson. Yes, um, I um, have spent the past 24 hours brooding on this fact that I've written far too many books. Somebody mentioned this. I went over to Melbourne um, in Australia, and somebody also mentioned the enormous number of books I'd written, which um, worried me. 
I, I have a very expensive wife and family, and in England it's almost impossible to live by writing. If you write my kind of books, you know, they don't sell all that much. It's only now that I'm 62. You know, my first book came out when I was 24. But um, I'm beginning to get royalties just about enough to stop me from working at this frenzied speed. <laughs> but you see, you know, the answer to all this is that I've written the same book over and over again. Um, <laughs> Some um, journalist once said to me, Mr. Wilson, is it true that you've written the same book 60 times over? I said, no, 80. <laughs> <laughs> because the basic truth is that all of my work is about the same thing, has the same center of gravity, and the same things have fascinated me ever since I was about 10 years old. So what I've continued to do is, in a sense, simply develop um, the, these basic ideas. And I suppose the basic question when I was a small boy was very simple and obvious. It was the feeling of enormous happiness that you had at Christmas. Then the fact that the rest of the year seemed so incredibly boring by comparison. <laughs> and the feeling that you got at Christmas that this was true, that the world really was this wonderful, exciting place. Then the fact that if you really believe that, then you know, by about January the 5th, you were already beginning to question your insights. <laughs> so this was the basic question, the feeling of intensity in certain moments, which in every case was like going to the same hilltop and seeing the same vision, and then being back down, as it were, in the valley and feeling that somehow the whole thing was an illusion. This, you know, for me was the basic problem. I realized later that, in a sense, what happens in these moments of intensity is that you experience what might be called the bird's eye view of reality, in which you can see it spread out underneath you as if you're taking off in an airplane. And that every time this happens, you say, my God, yes! And then, when you're back on the ground, once again, the intensity and the insight have gone. And you're back in this feeling of, you know, no, it's a basically dreary place. Now, this is interesting because it's to do, obviously, with the state self-consciousness. And the fact that whenever you are tired, and miserable, you'll find yourself in this state in which things actually look dull and worse still, meaningless. You know, when you're a child and you're very tired, you have this feeling that the world is basically meaningless. And you know, when, you, uh, when you're an adult and you get miserable and low, you have this strange feeling which Sartre calls nausea. You know, just this feeling that the physical world is so overwhelming that you don't stand a chance against it. And yet again and again, whenever the moments of insight come, you're suddenly in charge, and you have this peculiar feeling that the possibilities of consciousness are so much greater than you ever thought. That if only you could grasp the essence of it, like getting a map of this city, which you see from the bird's eye view, that you would always work your way back to the states of intensity. And you could say this, in a sense, has been the basic aim of my whole life. Also, just before my first book came out, which, as I say, was in 1956, just before my 24th birthday, um, and the 25th birthday, I uh, went to meet um, various literary figures at a literary party for the first time in my life, and among these was a novelist called Iris Murdoch, who had a, a weird obsession that what I ought to do was to go to university. <laughs> she obviously had a feeling that I was a rival and wanted to destroy me. <laughs> but I can still remember clearly saying to Iris, 
But my basic desire was to, as Shaw said in Back to Methuselah, to live to be 300. I could see very clearly that this was a possibility. Shaw said in Back to Methuselah that it would simply happen. There was no formula. You couldn't eat or drink anything that would make you live that long. But it would happen. Then, as I've got older, I've begun to see the way in which it could happen. Great conductors of orchestras tend to live into their 80s or 90s. Great mathematicians live, on average, into their 80s and 90s. Um, many great philosophers have lived into their 80s or 90s. This is clearly because they're driven by some basic sense of meaning and purpose. Now, on the other hand, when The Outsider first came out, my French publisher was Gallimard, and um, my editor at Gallimard was Albert Camus. And I went along to meet Camus in Paris, and I said to him that it seemed to me that his work again and again had this peculiar drive and vision, and that always it disappeared like a sort of candle flame going out. And you see this again and again in Camus' work. In his first book, L'Etranger, whose title I borrowed from my first book, The Outsider, a story about a man who, in a way, feels that life is sort of boring and repetitive and meaningless and that there is no overall meaning. Sartre had said at the end of being and nothingness, it is meaningless that we live and meaningless that we die. Man is a useless passion. Camus had borrowed from him this phrase, the absurd. And the time Camus first expresses this feeling of the absurd is in his first book, The Myth of Sisyphus, or his first major philosophical book, a couple of books of essays first, in which he said, you know, you go to work, you come home, you go to work, you come home, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, until suddenly you're hit by the sheer meaninglessness of this procedure. You're hit by the absurd, by the sense of, why? <laughs> he said, and from that moment you wake up. Now, this at the time struck me as extremely dubious. Because whenever I get that feeling of, why, it's always when I'm terribly tired and fed up. And I said to Camus, you've got six instances in your work in which suddenly the central character is gripped by a sense of purpose and meaning. One of them is in a very early essay um, in a volume called L'Envers et l'Endroit in which he talks about being on the beach at a place called Jamila in Algeria, where he was born, and says that looking at the great birds in the sky overhead, he suddenly has an immense feeling of reality. He says the weight of his own life squarely on his own shoulders that makes him feel that all this stuff about afterlife and Christianity and so on is total nonsense. He has, of course, this uh, similar passage at the end of um, The Stranger, in which the hero, who has been condemned to death uh, for a crime he didn't commit, and he's listening to a priest exhorting him to repent, suddenly loses his temper, grabs the priest by the throat and shakes him violently, and then feels afterwards this sudden total feeling of release. And he says, looking out at the universe, suddenly has this feeling of oneness with the stars and everything else, and suddenly says, I suddenly knew that I'd been happy, and I was happy still. The feeling that we all get in these moments of curious intensity, the knowledge that life in itself is immensely good. Whitehead said, life is a certain absoluteness of self-enjoyment. What he should have said, of course, is, Life should be a certain absoluteness of self-enjoyment. But in these curious moments, it happens, 
and it suddenly becomes an absoluteness of self-enjoyment. Anyway, I was explaining to Camus about these various other things in his work. There's another one in a story called The Woman Taken in Adultery. In which suddenly someone experiences that total feeling of reality and of overwhelming affirmation. And I said, the trouble is, the basic idea of your work, the notion that life is meaningless, is contradicted by these moments of insight. Can't you somehow recognize that what you've got to write about are these moments of tremendous intensity in which you suddenly know the answer. And Camus gestured at a sort of teddy boy wandering past the window of Gallimard's, sort of slouching past, and said, no, what is good for him must be good for me also. And I got sort of tremendously excited and said, you know, that's nonsense. Um, supposing Einstein had said that he couldn't produce the theory of relativity because, you know, the teddy boy wandering past his office window wouldn't understand it. <laughs> you see, that what Camus had said was good existentialism. Kierkegaard was the first person to say that there can be no such thing as an existential system, a philosophical system, which is based upon the actual fact of our everyday life and your problems when you wake up in the morning. That's the real basic problem of existentialism. And when Kierkegaard said there can be no philosophical system, what he meant was, as soon as you begin to reason about the problems of human existence, you're already, like Hegel, pulling away from those problems, and therefore, to some extent, falsifying them. There's a story by Andreev called Ben Tobit about a little Jew who wakes up one morning with a terrible toothache. And all day long, he's in this awful agony. And later that afternoon, as he looks out of his window, he sees a man staggering along with a cross on his shoulder, followed by two other men. And later, he hears that this chap has been crucified. But it doesn't mean a damn thing to him. All that matters is his bloody toothache. <laughs> now, this is the basic problem of human existence. What about my toothache? <laughs> Never mind whether somebody's been crucified or not. Never mind whether he's supposed to have saved humanity from original sin. What about my toothache? <laughs> this is the basic problem of existentialism. And yet you can see that if you keep saying, what about my toothache? There's no possible way of getting above the sheer boredom of the present moment. You're stuck in it. You, whether you like it or not, an existential system has got to be possible. Whether or not you can believe in it at the time. And this, for me, has always been the basically interesting problem. The fact that whenever it happens, you think, God, yes. Of course. And then the next morning you wake up thinking, of course what? <laughs> How do we connect these two things? That sense of meaninglessness, like a child being violently sick after a Christmas party <laughs> and thinking that all food is an illusion. <laughs> but it really is horrible, sickening stuff that you are persuaded to take for your own good and that really basically simply produces nausea. This is the basically interesting problem. And the problem that obsessed me from the beginning. I could see that in moments of happiness and intensity, something odd happens inside the head. And that what appears to happen is simply connections. That it's almost as if in normal consciousness, what is inside your head is frozen like ice. And that suddenly, when you get into these curious states of happiness, you experience an increasing warmth. And the warmth turns the ice into water. And suddenly, you can throw a stone into it and ripples spread out over the surface of consciousness. And you throw a second stone in, and those ripples interact with the first lot of ripples. And you can keep on doing this with an increasing sense of revelation and intensity. And then, the next morning, 
you wake up to the same old feeling that it was all an illusion, that you're stuck, whether you like it or not, in boredom and ordinary consciousness. Now, clearly, somebody is a fucking liar. <laughs> somebody is somehow deceiving us. Supposing you had the strength and the certainty to state clearly this is not true, and then to smash through this sense of boredom by sheer force, by sheer drive. Supposing, supposing everybody here actually was so certain of this that from now on, you decided that never again am I going to be defeated by stupidity and by the sense of boredom. We could be the first real human beings on the surface of the planet. We could be completely different. All human beings, ever since the beginning of time, like all animals, have been up against it. We get used to the fact that life is a sort of continual, long drawn out defeat. We get used to the fact that at the end of this, we die. And what's more, all of our philosophers, since the beginning of human culture, have been telling us that life is basically negative. Plato explained that we human beings are like people stuck in a cave with a fire behind us which casts our shadow on the wall, but we can never turn to the light which will show us the reality behind us. Aristotle said that it is better not to have been born, and life is actually inferior to death. All philosophers ever since then have taken this basically negative viewpoint. And the culmination, of course, was in the 19th century with Schopenhauer who produced this enormous book to prove that life is basically meaningless. In the world as well an idea, what Schopenhauer says basically is that whenever we badly want something and then get it, we immediately feel bored by it. That wanting something gives us a sense of purpose and meaning and then the purpose and meaning dissolves away and we're back again in what you might call the worm's eye view of existence. And that this is the basic problem. We keep getting dragged back to earth as if by some force of gravity which allows us temporarily to escape but which keeps pulling us back to earth. Now unfortunately all Western philosophy at that time had taken the same turn. Descartes had said the same sort of thing. If we wish to arrive at truth, we must pursue a scientific method, um, which is based on the scientific notion of doubting everything and then trying to prove it. Once philosophy had got into this completely negative circuit, um, what happened, well, first of all, was that the English philosopher, or Scottish philosopher, David Hume, said, um, when I look inside myself to see whether there's a real David Hume, I don't find anything at all. I just find a lot of ideas and impressions floating around in the wind. There's no real me inside me. And then, of course, he went on to say the same thing applies to thought. Thought is nothing more than ideas joined to one another in a chain-like effect. You don't really think. Thought is thought for you by circumstances outside you. You're a penny in the slot machine. And of course, Kant tried to reverse this whole procedure by saying, well, in fact, when you really analyze things in Hume's way, you see that basically what he's saying is true. You remember Bishop Barclay saying, everything is our ideas and impressions. A piece of chocolate is actually a taste of sweetness, a color of brownness. The color of brownness is added by your eyes. The taste of sweetness is added by your tongue. And he went on to say, you know, everything about the block of chocolate is non-existent. You've added it with your own mind. Therefore, we've created the world around us. 
everything can be seen as something we have created with our own minds. In other words, it's an enormous illusion which is simply going to disappear like a bubble sooner or later. This sort of basically Buddhist idea that the world is something that we have to turn our back on because it's sour and we have to learn to discipline ourselves if we're not going to be poisoned by the sourness. This idea of disciplining yourself seemed to me to be basically true, which is why in my teens I was basically, I suppose, a Buddhist. But the Kantian notion is that this world outside us, the thing in itself, is basically totally unknowable. What Kant, of course, went on to say, and he thought he was really cheering everybody up, is, don't worry, your mind imposes its categories on the world. Space, time, causality, or the rest of it, your mind contributes. In which case, instead of sort of like Bishop Barclay or David Hume saying, um, you really have no power whatsoever over the external world, it imposes its meanings on you, Kant said, on the contrary, your mind is imposing its meanings on things. You, in a certain sense, are all-powerful, which is a wonderful idea. Except, of course, why don't you know it? Three German writers, at least, committed suicide as a result of being influenced by Kant. <laughs> when I talked to Camus, I also felt that in a funny sort of sense, he had nowhere to go. He told me about the last novel he was writing, a thing called The Last Man, no, The First Man, Le Premier Homme, in which he said that it was about a man who had rejected religion, politics, education, philosophy, totally, only to discover that he himself had to create a religion, a politics, an educational theory, and a philosophy. We found it to be interesting and yet it didn't answer that fundamental question that all his work was about. The feeling of total meaninglessness. You go to work, you come home, and you go to work and you come home, and you, you suddenly realize it's all meaningless. I felt, you know, there's something very dangerous about this notion. What do you do when things get really bad if you feel that it's all meaningless? You know, even if you're totally honest about it, as Camus was. So when, a couple of years later, Camus, who was supposed to be writing an introduction to my second book, uh, was killed suddenly, I felt that this, in a sense, was logical. He'd come to the end of his tether. There was nowhere else to go. Somehow, you must have a sustaining belief from inside you, what Granville Barker called the secret life. And everything else has got to come out of that secret life. You know, and I'm not talking about anything very profound. You can just suddenly, when you're feeling a bit fed up, think, ah, oh, my favorite television program is on this evening. And suddenly you experience that spark of happiness and intensity. Now, when um, The Outsider came out, I got a letter, and anyone who's ever heard me before will have heard all this stuff, but nevertheless, I've got to go through it. My poor wife was sitting back there. God, the number of times she's heard it. <laughs> um, I got a letter from an American professor of psychology called Abraham Maslow. And Maslow had read a book of mine called In America and the Stature of Man, which said that the trouble with modern literature is that everybody tends to assume that man is so easily defeatable. I, I called it the fallacy of insignificance, the fact that all the heroes in serious modern novels tend to get defeated at the end. And it's only in non-serious modern novels like James Bond that you actually have a non-defeatable hero. What I wanted to know is, is it impossible to create a serious hero who is nevertheless not defeated? Maslow wrote to me and said that he got fascinated by all this 
because he himself, as a psychologist, had got so totally bored with studying sick people talking about nothing but their bloody sickness. <laughs> he decided that what he wanted to do was look around for the healthiest people he could find and study them, because no one else before had ever studied healthy people. So he asked among his friends, who's the healthiest person you know? And um, they put him onto various friends. And he then studied this group of healthy people and quickly discovered something that nobody else had ever discovered before because nobody had ever thought of studying healthy people. And that is that all healthy people have a great frequency, what Maslow called peak experiences, just bubbling experiences of sheer overwhelming happiness. And Maslow um, talked to his students about these and the students began to say, yes, yes, you know, that, that's happened to me too. Um, in one case, a Marine who'd been in the Pacific for several years without seeing a woman went back to base camp and saw a nurse and immediately had a peak experience. <laughs> he said because he suddenly recognized that women are different from men. That's the essence of the peak experience, this sudden perception of difference which you don't normally notice. Again, one of his students was a young mother with um, the husband and kids and one morning she was watching them eating breakfast when suddenly a beam of sunlight came in through the window and she thought, my God, aren't I lucky? And went into the peak experience. Now the interesting thing about that is she was lucky before the beam of sunlight came in through the window, but the beam of sunlight suddenly awoke her to the recognition that she was lucky. Difference, perception of difference, instead of taking for granted. I'd already recognized this in a conception I called the robot. We've all got a kind of robot inside us which does things for us. We human beings are the most efficient beings on the surface of this planet because we've got such an efficient robot compared to other people, other animals. The robot learns things for you. You learn French painfully word by word. The robot takes it over and talks French for you. You learn to drive a car movement by movement. The robot takes it over and drives your car forward. The, um, you learn to type or you learn to ski or you learn to do a dozen other things. In each case, the robot takes over and does it for you far more efficiently than you could do it consciously. If you try interfering with the robot once it's doing it efficiently, you screw him up completely. If somebody says to me, which foot do you use on the accelerator in your car? I couldn't tell you. I, I have to wiggle my feet, but luckily my feet know. <laughs> so this is the great thing about the human robot. It does things for us. The only trouble is it not only does things that we want it to do, it does things we don't want it to do. And so you experience, let's say, a poem or a symphony, or you go for a walk which strikes you as superb, but the fifth time you do it, the robot is also doing it with you. It's like sort of singing in concert with someone else. And then, of course, eventually, if you're not careful, the robot takes over and does these things instead of you. I've said I've even caught him making love to my wife. And <laughs> this is our fundamental program. The robot takes us over. Unless we can stay into such a state of drive and intensity that this does not happen. Now clearly, what was happening in Maslow's case, in the case of Maslow's students, was that somehow the robot was being pushed aside in certain moments of happiness. One of his students was um, a young man who was working his way through college as a jazz drummer. He said that he'd had a peak experience one morning at 2 o'clock in the morning when he was drumming and suddenly he began to drum so perfectly that he couldn't do a thing wrong. And then he went into the peak experience. You can see that at a certain moment, you and the robot are balanced like that. And then suddenly, something suddenly makes you relax. And suddenly, you have taken over. The real you has taken over. And the robot is doing your will, absolutely. And in those moments, you drum absolutely perfectly or you do whatever you're doing absolutely perfectly. An unbeatable combination you and the robot are, 
when you're really working together perfectly. You suddenly have an intuition that if you and the robot could really work together perfectly, you'd be a god, because this is really what it amounts to. It amounts to doing something so perfectly that suddenly you take over completely from the robot, and the robot does what you want it to do. This, of course, is what happens with all great singers, let's say, great actors, even great scientists. A certain moment comes in which there's that perfect combination of the two, and it all happens. Now, what's happening at the moment is that we human beings somehow have got it all sort of out of connection. If only we could get into this habit of relaxing deeply. You see, you might say that under normal conditions, you are 50% robot, and 50% what you might call real you. And you get used to this. You think that's you. You go through your life feeling that this is true. Sometimes you get these little moments of happiness. That's what my first book, The Outsider, was about. These 19th century romantics, basically, who had this sudden wonderful feeling of overwhelming happiness I mean, suddenly the whole universe seems magnificent. And then the feeling the next morning, my God, what was all that about? I loved using as an illustration of this Van Gogh's painting of the starry night, in which the whole sky seems to turn into a tremendous whirlpool of sheer vitality in which the trees seem to be green flames surging up towards the sky. And yet, after painting that, Van Gogh died by shooting himself in the stomach and leaving a suicide note that said, misery will never end. And this, for me, was the great question, which was true, the starry night or the suicide note? Well, we have no doubt, have we? When we look at the starry night, we know that was true. We know that Van Gogh was a great painter. He didn't know that. He doubted himself to the end. That's why he killed himself. This curious self-doubt that everybody experiences almost every moment of their life as a kind of ground base of their life. What I'm trying to say is that if it's true for Van Gogh, it's true for everybody. Absolutely everybody. The starry night is true. The suicide note is false. And as soon as you can recognize this, you've suddenly got an extremely powerful instrument in your hands. Because it suddenly means that you are capable of behaving in a different way from the way you've always behaved at certain crucial moments. Do you remember a film called The Sound Barrier? about the first aeroplane to go faster than the speed of sound, and the fact that at greater speeds than sound, planes went into a spin and then crashed. And according to the film, which was slightly inaccurate, but nevertheless basically true, one pilot finally discovered the trick. You kept trying to pull out of a dive more and more frantically and all you had to do was to push the stick forward instead, and the plane went out of the spin. As speeds greater than sound, some of the normal laws of physics are reversed. And the same goes for us human beings. Under great pressure, great intensity, something gets reversed, and you've got to understand it. And instead of flinging yourself down, in a miserable heap and screaming, oh God, no, no. You just push the stick forward instead of pulling it back. And suddenly everything changes. Now, I discovered this by a very painful experience. In, um, 
the early 1970s, I was working on a magazine about crime. And uh, they wanted me to work tremendously hard. Uh, they suddenly said, OK, we're off. The American um, financier has said we're OK, but we must get the magazine off the ground. And uh, I was one of the editors of the magazine, and it was my job to do the major article in every single issue of this park work. So if the park work it was on crime, basically, was, let's say, on pirates, I had to do the history of piracy in 3,000 words. If it was on kidnapping, I had to do the history of kidnapping. If it was on mass murder, I had to do the history of mass murder, and so on. And I had something like 120 articles to write like this. Anyway, I didn't mind this because, you know, basically I'm fascinated. I, I love pulling facts together. This is my basic obsession. But unfortunately, they wanted seven articles a week of 3,000 words long. And, you know, 21,000 words a week is a lot of work. I mean, it's a fifth of a full-length book. Anyway, I did it, and I got into my stride, and I did it fairly well. And then suddenly they said, look, we've got to have 10 articles a week. And so what I was doing was an article and a half per day. And I was still going pretty well. You know, they were paying me well for it. You know, <laughs> almost the first time since my first book had come out, I'd really got money in the bank. And so I wasn't going to flunk this. But two bloody journalists came to see me at about this time, and they talked and talked and talked and talked. They talked for two days solid. They kept me up until 3 o'clock in the morning talking. And uh, it was this that did it. You know, you suddenly get that feeling, oh, my God, no. And of course, when you are in a state of tremendous tension producing work, this is the worst thing you can do. Give the signal to your unconscious mind, no. And that night, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking how much work I'd got to do. I began to sweat and began to get the feeling that I'd got to get down to my desk. And at 3 in the morning, I thought, if I do that, I'm really insane. But my heart began to beat faster and faster and faster. I leapt out of bed and rushed to the lavatory and just sat there on the lavatory trying to calm myself, like calming a frightened horse. And after about half an hour, I felt better, and I went back to bed. As soon as I got into bed, it started up again, this pounding of the heart. I thought I was having a heart attack. And I got up and went into the sitting room and just put the lights on and sat there thinking, what's the matter with me? What's gone wrong? And there was suddenly this horrible feeling that life is basically not just absurd, but nasty, cruel. For example, the thought of lambs, which I'd seen that afternoon in the next field, came to me. And the thought that although these stupid sheep didn't know it, their lambs were going to be killed and eaten. And it suddenly seemed to me that this is true of us all, that we're all going to be killed and eaten. And that we're all in this same situation. We're hoping, you know, that life is OK, and its intentions towards us are of the worst. Anyway, finally, I went back to bed. I discovered an interesting thing. If I stared at the window, just this gray square, and just focused upon it, everything was OK. If I let myself go, I suddenly plunged back inside myself, and I plunged into what I've some, uh, since then come to call the swamp of subjectivity, this sort of horrible area inside you, this gray area, where you're suddenly worried and churning like mad. And I found that the answer was to focus upon that window out there. And as soon as I did that, as soon as I paid attention to the window, in the way that if I now said to you, hark, you would all listen carefully, your attention now focused upon the external world. And it's that focusing of the attention upon the external world that suddenly gives you control over this inner mess. Anyway, it went on for weeks, months, until I gradually learned to control it. I learned, learned partly through a, an American friend who came to stay with me, who said that he'd had these panic attacks too. You know, I'd just wake up and my heart would go faster and faster and faster, until I felt such frenzy that I, I felt that I wanted to get up and walk in the fields around the house, just to calm myself down. And he said, oh yeah, I went to see a psychiatrist about this. And, um, he was very, very expensive, and he was honest enough to say to me, 
Um, well, you know, you, you can, if you like, pay me $10,000, but on the other hand, um, if you wait three months, it'll go away anyway. <laughs> and this was a great relief. And so, you know, I learned to sit on top of this awful panic which boiled over like boiling milk. But the main discovery was this discovery of what I'd discovered the first day, of staring at the window frame. Now, think what happens. You could say, as I say, that you are 50% robot and 50% real you, and you take that for granted. But when you go into the peak experience, you suddenly shoot up, the real you shoots up to 51 or 52%, and the robot goes down to 49 or 48%. That's what it's really about. You're just no longer so robotic. Your machine isn't taking you over. Now think what happens when <clears throat> you get this curious feeling of certainty and happiness. Suddenly, the real you goes up to 53 or 54%. And when Van Gogh was painting The Starry Night, he was up to 55%, and the robot was down to 45%. Now, what happens when the robot takes you over? You get tired. You so go. You let out your inner pressure, just like letting air out of a tire. And you know what happens if you try to drive on a flat tire. The tire gets destroyed within a few minutes. You've also seen that inscription on the side of some tires, keep inflated hard. The greater your inner pressure, the greater your resistance to the things that are going on outside you. So the basic formula is keep inflated hard, as hard as you can possibly go. Now what is interesting is that you are normally 50-50. When you're sort of normal and cheerful and you know, not getting low, this is the normal state of affairs. All you have to do is that extra 1% and get used to doing the extra 1% until the extra 1% becomes almost robotic in you. You do it automatically. You see what I'm trying to say? We human beings are on the point of something very interesting indeed. We are on the point of moving to a state where your normal state will be 51% real you. And that'll happen when you feel more basically cheerful about the real you. Maslow found that when he talked to his students about peak experiences, they began remembering peak experiences which they'd had in the past and which they'd just taken for granted and forgotten about in the way that you do when you're happy. But as soon as they began recalling the peak experiences and talking to one another about the peak experiences, they began having peak experiences all the time because they realized, as it were, this is our natural birthright. It's completely natural in us. Maslow said to his students, which among you thinks you're going to be great? And they looked back blankly. And Maslow said, if not you, who then? And suddenly they understood what he was talking about. Do you see that in terms of, let's say, somebody who lived in the Elizabethan age, everybody sitting here this evening is a genius of the rank of Shakespeare? If you were back in the Elizabethan age, you would find that the average mechanic and so on was a, at an incredibly low level of stupidity. We handle in an incredibly complex life completely naturally. We may find it a bit difficult, but we do it. And if you could bring a bunch of Elizabethan mechanics on a tour of San Francisco with you as the leader of the party, they would look up to you with open mouths and regard you as a god. 
We really have this extraordinary capacity to handle complexities. The only trouble is that we don't admire ourselves enough. <laughs> we don't recognize how good we are. Now, as soon as I began to recognize this, I saw that there is here an ordinary mechanism. And that as soon as you understand the mechanism, then you've begun to get in charge of the problem. The mechanism is the mechanism recognized by Maslow, but basically it's the mechanism of outfacing the robot and his attempt to convince you that you are really tired and low and not very good. I love, you know, quoting this thing which I've quoted in every lecture I've ever given about Graham Greene playing Russian roulette with his brother's revolver when he was a teenager and feeling completely miserable and low and pointing the revolver at his head, spinning the chambers and then pulling the trigger. And he says when there was just a click, he looked down the barrel and saw that the bullet had now come into position and he missed death by just one. And he said an over overwhelming feeling of relief and exultation swept over him and he suddenly said that he suddenly saw that life is infinitely beautiful and complex and fascinating. He said it was as if a light had been turned on and I suddenly saw how marvelous everything is. Now, if any of you have tried to read Green's dreary novels, <laughs> you will wonder about this insight <laughs> because it is quite obvious that he feels that we're all entangled in original sin, we're all incapable of any kind of freedom and that eventually we are all going to be defeated. Now, I think on the other hand of Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna said that during childhood, he experienced these weird feelings of sheer happiness at religious festivals. And that one day, crossing the fields carrying a bowl of rice, suddenly, a flight of white cranes flew against the black thundercloud and the sight struck him as so incredibly beautiful that he lost consciousness and fell on the ground and the rice flew all over the place. From then on, he had this incredible sensitivity to beauty. Then he became a priest and found that it had gone completely, entered, you know, the dark night of the soul. And he said one day, in a state of immense despair at the feeling that it had gone and he wasn't capable of getting it back. The state of despair that caused so many of the 19th century romantics to commit suicide, like Van Gogh. He seized a sword and was about to plunge it through himself when suddenly he said, the Divine Mother revealed herself. And he saw that everything is magnificent and this overwhelming feeling of sheer vitality once again knocked him unconscious, unconscious this state we call Samadhi. Now, think, from then on, Ramakrishna could achieve samadhi by simply hearing the name of the Divine Mother. This was enough to trigger him into this state. So, why couldn't Graham Greene recall what he saw when he pulled the trigger, which was just the same? Why could Ramakrishna do it again and again, and Graham Greene stopped? Graham Greene did it six times and got bored the sixth time. <laughs> it no longer worked for him. You can see that Schopenhauer would say, yeah, of course, naturally. Life is basically an illusion, and all that happened was that Graham Greene got so terrified for a moment as he pulled the trigger that it raised him above the normal level of sheer boredom, but then he recognized that boredom is the fundamental truth. Now, clearly, Ramakrishna not only did not recognize this, but could instantly grasp it again and again and again. Now, it seems to me the difference lies in that mechanism I've spoken of, 50-50, and the fact that you can push yourself into states of intensity simply by making that additional mental effort. You know, I mean, I, I'm sort of getting pretty old now for going around lecturing. I, I'm getting tired, frankly. I can no longer do two-day workshops. They, they wear me out. And when I have to do trips like this one, 
I was asked to go to Melbourne first for two weeks and then here and then in New York. I'll be away from home for almost a month. I do find it sort of, you know, fairly tiring. And then when I learned that the trip to Melbourne from London was 37 and a half hours in the air. You know, we left Saturday midday and we arrived at Melbourne at 10 o'clock on Monday morning. My thought at first was of utter despair. I hate travel anyway. And then I suddenly thought, oh, come on, don't be stupid. Then I thought of Terry Waite, who was chained to a radiator in Beirut for two years. And I thought, you know, by comparison, traveling in an airplane for 36 hours isn't all that bad. And in point of fact, I found that as soon as I put myself into this state of mind, everything was fine. You know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the trip. I got a lousy cold as soon as I got there, which was if fate had imposed one more condition. Okay, come on, get out of this one. And, and I lectured straight through it. And luckily, it always worked. My voice would disappear completely before a lecture. And then, you know, because I really wanted it to come back and made the effort, it would come back. And this is the first time I've lectured normally for two weeks, you know, my voice sounding normal. This recognition that your unconscious mind will do it, provided you, the conscious self, are sufficiently optimistic and sure that you can rely upon it. How long have I got, Michael? You see, the problem is I, I sort of go on for hours and hours and hours. I really take a week to explain my ideas fully and totally. And there are so many things that I, I would like to say. And briefly, I, I sort of run into this stuff about the, the left and right brain, although you all know it perfectly well. Because, uh, as you know, you've got these two people in your brain, that, which they discovered by splitting the brain down the middle. They discovered they could stop epilepsy by slicing the corpus callosum down the middle of the brain and stopping the epileptic attack from passing from one side of the brain to the other. Um, they then discovered that these split brain patients became two people, <coughs> literally. If you showed them one thing with the left eye and one thing with the right eye without letting them see what the other eye was seeing, they didn't know what the other eye was seeing. So <coughs> you showed a patient an orange with the left eye, which is connected to the right brain, an apple with the right eye, which is connected to the left brain, and you said, what have you just seen? They'd reply, apple. If you said, write with your left hand what you've just seen, they'd write orange. If you said, what have you just written? They'd reply, apple. Two people. Show them a dirty picture with their right brain, they'd blush. You say, why are you blushing? They'd say, I don't know. <laughs> You've got two people inside your head. Now, the interesting thing is, you would say, well, that applies to split brain patients, but not to the rest of us. But in fact, Mozart said that tunes were always wandering into his head, fully fledged, and all he had to do was to write them down. Where were they coming from? That other person in the right brain. And the Mozart, who lived in his left brain, wrote them down. Now, if Mozart was a split brain patient, so are we all. The interesting thing is that these two halves of the brain seem to have a peculiar relationship, which I once compared to Laurel and Hardy in the old movies. Your left brain, that is the you who are now listening to me, the, your personality, <coughs> is exactly like Ollie, <coughs> the sort of fat one who is in charge. The person who lives on the other side in your right brain, the stranger, is exactly like Stan. So he's rather stupid. He has no sense of time, exactly like my wife. And really has this state, this continual condition of not being quite in charge of his own experience. The odd thing about Stan is that he is the one who supplies your energy. So when something nice happens, Ollie says, <coughs> marvelous, you know, it's Christmas. And Stan overhears and says, marvelous, it's Christmas, because he always exaggerates. And he sends up lots and lots of energy. And that's why at Christmas, children have this bubbling feeling. And that, of course, is why Ramakrishna, once he got into the habit of believing that the world is absolutely wonderful, was able to go into samadhi at any moment. He convinced Stan and Stan is in charge of your energy supply. You're two people. You, the conscious you, who's now listening to me, and Stan on the other side. 
And if I can get through to Stan, <laughs> something very interesting happens. <clears throat> hypnotists do this. What a hypnotist does is to put Ollie to sleep, and Stan remains wide awake. And the hypnotist then says to you, OK, you're going to lie down across those two chairs with your heels on that chair and your head on that one, and two strong men are going to jump up and down on your stomach, and you won't bend in the middle. And Stan says, yes, sir. And he does it. So why can't you do it? Why can't Ollie say to Stan, OK, this is going to happen? Because unfortunately, you don't believe him. Stan knows he's a bloody liar. Yet in a sense, he's not a liar at all. All he has to do is to know that it's true. If Stan can make you not bend in the middle when a hypnotist tells you, then Stan can not make you bend in the middle when Ollie tells you. And you, listening to me now, are Ollie. We all have this incredible capacity once we know what we are capable of. I've been discovering this for a long time. I find that in the mornings when I'm in good condition, when I go to, down to my work, if I focus hard enough, attention, like the attention I pay to the window, is what snaps you out of the robotic state and into your real state. Pay attention, just ordinary attention, for five minutes. And already, you begin to strengthen this stand inside. Succeed in paying attention for 20 minutes, as you do, let's say, when you're listening to a great symphony and you're really, really carried away. And suddenly, Stan is so wide awake that he's flooding you with energy, like Van Gogh painting The Starry Night. So basically, attention is the answer. A workman once said to the Zen master, Ikkyu, Will you write something significant on my tablet? And Ikki wrote, attention. And the workman said, oh, come on, that's not very significant. Write something else. So he wrote, attention, attention. <laughs> and the workman said, what does attention mean? And Ikki said, attention means attention. <laughs> you can see, he got it. That's what it's all about. You see. I remember a, an occasion when I was Italy, in Italy a few years ago. On a Saturday evening, we'd been out for dinner, and we hadn't bothered to fill up the car at the local petrol station, which closed down on Sunday. We thought it doesn't matter. In fact, some friends arrived. The following day, we took a long drive with them, and suddenly saw that the indicator of the petrol indicator was down to naught, and we were in the middle of the Italian countryside with no knowledge of you know, where the nearest station was, and I couldn't speak Italian anyway. And with this feeling of, oh, you fool, you should have overcome your boredom and gone to the garage last night and filled up. But nevertheless, you know, we drove along for another 10 miles and found ourselves on a motorway. And I drove down that motorway with my heart in my mouth until we saw a petrol station. And you know, we filled up right to the top with this enormous feeling of relief. Now, I've since recognized that that was a symbolic situation. That in some way, we are always letting our tanks get almost empty. This is the reason that life can defeat us. We just get into this state of drifting, of living mechanically, of doing the same thing today that we did yesterday and the day before, and the petrol gets quite low in the tank. What you have to remember to keep doing is stopping at a gas station and filling up. And the way you do that is paying attention. At any hour of the day, at any moment of the day, you can fill yourself up with gas. You can add another two gallons to what you've already got in the tank. By merely stopping, stopping what you are doing and paying attention. And you actually discover that as soon as you focus hard, as I've discovered in the mornings when I'm writing well, and at the same time paying attention to what I'm doing, quite suddenly something happens inside you. Something strange happens and you are in charge. And you suddenly know that 
If only you could overcome your own stupidity, you'd be in charge all the time, though there's no reason whatever why we human beings should accept life as a defeat. We could be permanently in charge, knowing precisely and exactly where we're going. This is why one day when the outsider first came out and I was lecturing to the Shaw Society in London, I suddenly found myself saying, to my great surprise, I believe that man is on the point of an evolutionary leap to a new phase. And that when that happens, we're going to have a completely different kind of creature who is not like man at all. Now, I didn't really see what I meant. I almost disbelieved myself. I thought, you know, maybe I was saying it for effect. I realized later that this thing had come bubbling out of the depths of me as a sudden insight. What's more, I've seen more and more clearly since then that we're on this point. We're 50-50. All we need is that certainty. Our basic trouble is that we're living in a completely negative culture. You know, inside those um, Venus fly traps that are full of um, a sort of horrible liquid and flies sip the honey and then fall into the bottom and float around, and then the Venus flytrap absorbs their liquid. This sort of liquid inside the Venus flytrap is fundamentally poisoned. Well, you are living in a poison culture. You're living in a culture in which idiots like Samuel Beckett and Graham Greene and William Golding and dozens of others are being stuffed down the throats of your kids at college. Naturally, they come out with bad indigestion. <laughs> but you can see that we're, in a sense, on the turning point. When The Outsider first came out in 1956, all of the people around me, sort of in London and later in America, um, tended to be left-wingers. They were all obsessed by the idea, you know, that communism would take over the world, and then everything would be OK. We'd have a sort of utopia. I always loathed and detested communism. Then, by 1960, everything began to change. Suddenly, we got this difference in the taste of the culture. Until now, even in our little village in Cornwall, a tiny fishing village, we have a yoga group. <laughs> Suddenly, people have recognized the change has come. Everything is about to turn around. And that recognition that we're on a point of a change to a higher level can you see exactly what I mean by that higher level? I myself, every time I'm forced to undertake some challenge like this trip, can suddenly see that this is, for me, the possibility of the turning point, that for the first time in my life, I'm going to remain totally in control of the experience, and at no point allow myself the slightest self-indulgence of boredom or nausea. And, you know, it can be done. I've been feeling lousy all day. I've jet-lagged seven hours. Two hours ago, I made an enormous effort, aided by a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> and I suddenly find, you know, OK, Stan has responded to the challenge and has come to my aid. Let, let, I've got to finish, but let me just finish with one more anecdote. Um, in London, a few years ago, I was asked by a film producer to go and write a, a script and whenever he asks me to go and write a script, he pays me a lot of money, but you know, they're all such lousy, god-awful scripts that I'm ashamed to do it. And he locks me in a hotel room for, in this case, seven days. And um, his Italian secretary comes and collects the pages as I write them. And I felt, really, this last script he gave me was so awful that um, there was nothing I could do with it. But anyway, I began to have thoughts. And um, he said, he showed me the original script. He said, Colleen, who is the murderer? And I said, Christ, Dino, don't you know? He said, no, you, you make up your mind. <laughs> and uh, so I worked away. And you know, it was so awful. I just had this feeling of despair. I had two days to go. The script was half finished. And suddenly. On the last night, I remembered what I've just been saying about Stan and Ollie. And I, as it were, put my hands together and said, you know, 
come on, Stan, come on, old right brain. For Christ's sake, do your stuff. Am I deluding myself? And the next morning, I woke up quite early. I wasn't feeling full of energy or anything, but I got writing, and suddenly it got better and better and better. And suddenly, by midday, I was in full state. By five o'clock, when Dino's secretary came to collect this rubbish, I'd finished the script two minutes before she knocked on the door. And, uh, you know, she said, what do you want to do now? I said, I want to go home to Cornwall. And they sent her on this huge Cadillac for me. I was driven to Paddington Station. And in the Cadillac, I sort of said, you know, oh, thank you, old right brain. <laughs> With the recognition that it will really do it if you sort of want it to deeply enough. That's the basic secret. Anybody sort of have any questions? <laughs> uh, Flash Gordon. <laughs> the fact that you, we all tend to get jaded and complacent, and you talk about kind of pumping yourself up, psyching yourself up to the experience. That tendency to um, become overstimulated or chasing your tail, a chimera riddle. What, how can we keep up this process? Wouldn't you go to the 51% and the 52% and it becomes the robot takes over again? How do you ever keep this alive without now, the thing? What you said is very interesting, which is, you know, how do you keep it up to this level? Don't you fall back into the robot? In fact, um, you asked the standard question, um, which I could have predicted, you know, before I started, because I get it after every single lecture. Oh, sometimes the form of the question is, if you had peak experiences all the time, wouldn't they become plateau experiences? That's, that's really what it is. Now, the answer you can actually think of, if you think of the fact that as a child, you weren't really capable of very much freedom. For example, a long school holiday, which seems superb in advance, got you bored after a couple of weeks. Adults can take more freedom. You know, they can sort of take three or four weeks and they, they feel free, and yet they would get bored. And yet the very fact of being adult means you're capable of more freedom than before. Now, when you feel free, you in fact recognize that you're free. You don't have this tendency to revert to the childish stage of only being able to take a few days school holiday. So what you're doing is pushing your freedom into new dimensions and provided you've got the, as it were, underpinning, and that's what I mean by keep filling up your petrol tank. Provided you've got the underpinning, it's okay. You've got to have the underpinning. Again, the, um, a friend uh, of mine at um, one college I was teaching in told me that she got utterly sick of the fact that her husband was being unfaithful to her here in San Francisco, in fact during the 60s, you know, during this era, and everybody was going down around to parties and having lots of promiscuous sex. And uh, she suddenly decided that she'd had enough and she was going to leave him. And at this, he got very upset and said, look, you know, I promise I'll be faithful. I'm, I'm going to move out to Ohio. And uh, <laughs> her brother said, well, look, I'm, I'm taking a place in Oregon in a college. Why don't you come along and be my housekeeper for a while and see how you feel? And she said she was torn in two by a desire to stay with her husband and by the indignation about his in infidelity, that, which made her feel, let's give him a lesson and go to Oregon. And she said for weeks she was struggling with this awful feeling, Oregon or Ohio, Oregon or Ohio. And she said one night in a state of crisis, he suddenly hit her. I don't have to go to Oregon or Ohio. I'm free. <laughs> and she said this overwhelming feeling of sheer joy. She said even her tennis improved. <laughs> because you can see that she got it down in her bottom levels, the secret life. She filled up a petrol tank, as it were, through this stress and strain, and Stan had finally decided to send her up the kind of energy and conviction that she needed. Now, that's all you've got to do. 
you've somehow got to get down to Stan and say, come on, please. Once you get used to your petrol tank being half full all the time, so you're never likely to be left stranded and bored and fed up and miserable, you suddenly realize this is the condition we human beings were supposed to be in all along. It's highly artificial to let your petrol tank get almost empty and then feel miserable and bored and low. You can think about it in advance and do something about it. Serial killing is an extension of the peak experience. Is serial murder an extension of the peak experience? That's a very interesting question because, as you know, I've written quite a lot about this. And that is a real problem. Now, it's, in, it's obvious to me that what the serial killer expects um, is some kind of peak experience that will permanently transform him. You might call it the sexual grail. He feels, you know, that there's a holy grail there in some terrific sexual intensity. You know, Ted Bundy um, saw a girl undressing in a lighted window one night and was so overwhelmed by this that he turned it into a kind of project and began wandering around the University of Seattle campus, peering through windows all the time until finally he found a, a door open and burst into the girl's room and attacked her and she screamed and he went away thinking, God, what have I done? How terrible, never, never again. But you know, so fascinated by the, this notion of girls undressing that he went back again and again and again until he finally broke into a room, abducted the girl, murdered her, and then went on and did this 40 times. Now, it's quite obvious that it became a bad habit. <laughs> and th what happens is that it takes you over in some weird way. But the early steps of the habit are this feeling of the sexual grail. That somehow, if you can just get the right experience, it will catapult you like Ramakrishna grabbing the sword until you will be perpetually in a sort of state of samadhi. Now, what happens is very interesting. We all require this experience of energy flowing. Human beings are the only evolutionary animal on the surface of the earth. We need the feeling that we are changing and evolving to be happy. If we don't have the feeling that we are changing and evolving, we get a feeling like mental constipation which can gradually completely depress you. You've got to feel you're evolving in some way. Now, this can happen quite simply in any experience of happiness, even on the lavatory. When you sort of relax and empty your bowels or your bladder, what happens is what you might call the flow experience. When you're hungry and you eat food, when you're thirsty and you drink, sex is the archetypal flow experience. We're like a river. We've got to flow in order to evolve. And the trouble is that if you let the river flow too slowly, the silt brought down from the hills gradually bungs up the bed of the river until it turns into something windy like a snake. Then, some violent emotional experience like Ramakrishna grabbing the sword or Graham Greene pointing the gun at his head and pulling the trigger causes a kind of flash flood in the hills, which sends a terrific volume of water down, which rips out the bottom of the riverbed, and suddenly you're straight again. You've got this lovely straight river. And once again, you have this feeling of normality and decency, and this is how we should be living all the time. 